virtually every documented civilization start their history with stories of godlike men who were superior in longevity, strength, height, and civility. They interject themselves into the primitive cultures with invaluable knowledge. In this episode, we will be discussing a hidden connection between the mysteries using historical and biblical evidence. So stay tuned and strap on your boots because we are live right now with the Midnight Ride. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. Good evening, everybody, and welcome once again to the Midnight Ride. It is our great honor to welcome each and every one of you into the Puritan Barn for another episode of the Midnight Ride. Tonight, the tribe of Dan is our focus. What has it meant in biblical history? What has it mean, its meaning in Bible prophecy, and what does it mean to us today? These are things, as John unpacks this information tonight, that you're going to realize we really need to know. So get ready. It all starts right now because we are now live, live, live. What's up, guys? It's so good to be here from the Puritan Barn once again. Let us know where you're from in the chat. Let us know how you're doing and comment if you're watching this after we are live. Uh, we're so excited to be here to do this. This is going to be, I, I, in my opinion, of course, you know, every show that I feel like that I, I research and I do gets better and better. And I think this one is going to be by far the best one that I've ever been able to pull off. And, you know, I, you guys have seen me grow over the years. Some of you guys have seen shows from 2016, even some from 2010. And you've seen a lot of different things go on here. And so this is a culmination of a lot of stuff. So I'm really excited about it. So please stay tuned and we'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. Mainstream companies put dangerous chemicals in their products that contribute to disease and disability. This is why it's so important that we take care in the products that we consume. The skin is the largest organ in your body and it is the covering to your temple. Our sponsor tonight is Sugar and Spice Soap Company. They create all natural and biblically clean soaps and beauty products. They even have a soap for Midnight Ride listeners. Use coupon code NYSTV to receive 10% off all your purchases. Link in the description. If this is true, then our country is in a lot of trouble. We would have these trips, these special trips. But he said, my, my daddy takes the bodies to the grocery store and he grinds them up and puts it in the hamburger. And nobody ever knows it. How can kids, six, eight, ten years old, be describing rituals that come from a book like the, like the Book of the Dead? It's hard to get your mind around people being capable of this kind of evil. All right, guys, we are back. Thank you guys so much for checking out. If you're interested in any of that, the links are in the description. Also, I want to give a shout out to Truther Fit. We have the Midnight Ride mugs that are our collector's edition, our first edition Midnight Ride mugs. And they are right now, if you guys use the code hashtag Torahead, Hashtag T O R A H H E A D. Use that. The, the actual is actually down in there. Use that, and you get fifty percent off the Midnight Ride mugs. Get them before they're gone. I think that they don't have that many left. 
they'll probably be out here within the next month or two so make sure you get those that will be the last run of this first edition before we introduce the next one so make sure you guys check that out david i know you guys got stuff going on over on fojc let me know what you guys got going on tomorrow night on fojc radio sunday night live 7 p.m central time our third episode of our city's lost in time series we will be focusing on tanak titlian the city of kane 7 p.m eastern it will be frosty i guarantee you very good looking forward to it i know that we've we've talked about these that before in our book of enoch and it was just an amazing study and it yeah. really opens up a lot about and, and even really kind of coincides a little bit with what we're talking about tonight so it be awesome. really does absolutely very good so david if you are ready i'm ready and i say going. let's ride all right guys so tonight this is going to be we're going to be talking about the connection between Bashan, the last king of the giants uh the tribe of dan who is also called the serpent in the path the serpent in the way in the scriptures and we're going to be talking about the reference to them and the blue buds and we're going to be talking about these connections uh, through the Bible and through historical means. Also, we're going to be discussing the connection between Atlantis and the new Atlantis America. And all of these things tie in really interestingly and into and, and almost in a way that makes so much sense with all the stories that we hear throughout time. And for some of those of you that don't, haven't heard of Blue Blood, so the, some of you who are maybe younger that have not heard this term, this is a common term that they would use to describe uh, people who were of royal stock or nobility and here's just a few clips from some old movies referencing this right here so if you were born blue bloods like your husband cleaning up skyscrapers his wife's a proper blue blood i'll give you a clue darius we can't keep the princess waiting blue blood you know so you see these references to blue bloods and you know for me i've always wondered about this what blue bloods actually means and so through this study, through finding out the study, we ran into a lot of stuff. And like I've said before, this is a culmination of a lot of things that we've studied. And I feel like I've been able to bring this together in a, in a puzzle in a way that maybe is relatable and some of you guys can grasp onto because this, um, this story that we hear throughout all of these legends, whether it be through Plato of, of the Atlanteans, the Tuatha, Tuatha de Danan from the Irish, uh, Incans, Mayans, they all have this story of these Viking-like men, um, men with long blonde hair, blonde, blonde hair, red hair, or blue eyes that come, and they're like gods, and they teach them civility. They teach them all of these different things as they come to their civilization. And I'm going to, this right here is just a short portion of a Manly P. Hall lecture, and Manly P. Hall was a 33rd degree Freemason, and um, had a lot of literature on the occult. And so we're going to check out a little bit of what he says, and then we're going to tie it in with Scripture and see where all this stuff fits in, because there is a huge deception here if, we don't, if we're not careful. Now this also causes us to have another little interlude here, which I think we should give a thought to. We are told by Plato and several other historians of the type of the time that mes various agencies, various merchants, travelers, explorers from Atlantis visited other lands. And among those who visited other lands were the priests of the Atlanteans, those who worshiped the great golden serpent. Serpent worship was one of the oldest religions of the world. Now these various missionaries, shall we say, went to primitive people as we send missionaries today to underprivileged or gradually evolving groups. And these missionaries set up various institutions uh, in the distant parts of the empire, the parts that were not actually destroyed by the destruction of the Atlantean centerland. Now, it seems to me, and I, I realize that this is hypothetical, but it seems to me that this explains a series of legends and myths which are of interest. So, obviously, when he's talking about here, we're talking about little mystery schools being placed all over the place and little civilizations being set up all across primitive people. Now, in at one point in time, post-flood, 
most stories, especially of native people to America and other stories, there's people that live underground. And then there's these beings that when they come up because the flood had ravaged the earth, they teach them these civilized acts. They teach them how to the laws. They teach them how to act as a civilization in a city. They teach them the ways of money and all of these different ideas. They, they teach them. And what we're seeing here is a same old story across every single civilization and it's it's pretty amazing da david do you have anything that you'd like to add here before we watch a little no, more you go right ahead john okay we're gonna at any point you want me to pause this we're gonna pause it and this is manly p hall kind of giving us more civilizations that tell this same story and a couple of the ones that they talk about here we're going to kind of dig down deep into because there's some symbols here and some things here that we do not want to miss and so here we go we are told for example the people of Chaldea and Babylonia were very primitive. That they had not yet discovered the use of fire. That they did not know how to cook food. They did not know how to keep records. They had no medical, medical knowledge. They had no laws to live by and no governments except tribal communes. And in the midst of all this time, while they were living along the shores of the sea, one day something strange happened. A being came out of the sea. This being whom they called Oanes had the body of a fish and the head of a human being and wore on his head the head of a fish on end. If you see the old pictures, you realize that his hat was what we call today a mitre. I wanted to pause it here for just a second, David, because... This is the story we talked about before. This is the yeah. story of the modern day kings. They say that they derive from a fish god. This is why we have the fisher kings and we have the yes. symbol of the fish that they have. Awanes being one of the most ancient, as well as kind of conformed into Dagon, Poseidon, and all of these creatures supposedly that came out of the ocean and had this progeny that are now our kings. Yeah, absolutely. Did you have anything you wanted to well, add to that? Well, the, the, the thing that, it, and you know, this is such an obvious, and for so many of our listeners, we've showed many times, and it's it's there for anyone that will look to see the, the mitre of Dagon upon the Pope's head. And Mr. Hall, who, when Mr. Hall passed away, I believe it was in 1980, I actually have his eulogy in the Scottish Rite Journal, and he was eulogized as Freemasonry's greatest philosopher. Now, he talked about these people being sent out as missionaries, and we've read before the quote from Alice Bailey how she talked about infiltration, and it should be obvious, the infiltration there with the Pope and the mitre on his hat, but we have to realize that this infiltration, and we've read from the book of Alice Bailey how it's come into our uh, into the church, into the education systems, people are going to have to come to the place where they can discern the spirit of God from the spirit of Antichrist, because the Antichrist is at work, not just in the Catholic Church, but in these uh, religious establishments that are non-Catholic. You know, it, this is very much, this missionary um, effort is still very much underway. That's for sure. And throughout this show, we're going to see an agenda that is taking place through all of this and how it applies to us now and in the future. So stay tuned. Here we go. Which is practically exactly the shape of a fish's head. And this man who came out of the sea had scales. Now, scales could very well represent armor. He carried symbols with him. And he was a good man. And he came to these people. And he taught them. He gave them a written language. He gave them the knowledge of agriculture. He taught them astronomy and the mystery of the stars. He helped them to build a permanent government, introduced them into the mysteries of architecture and the building of cities. And he also taught them the mysteries of heaven and the ways of the gods and taught them to live in obedience. And he told them that in due time, he would return. Now, on the opposite side of the world, something else was happening. The people of Central America were living in a very primitive state. Some of them were cannibals. They had no homes except rude huts. 
They had no instruments except cuts, cut from stone. They did not know how to cook their food. They had no written language and no way of recording their history, no knowledge of any of these things. And while they lived in this primitive condition, a strange thing happened. An old man came to them, riding on the back of serpents. And he came to the shore, and he was welcomed by them, these peoples. And his name is preserved in the three great languages of the central culture of the period and time and place. Uh, to the Aztecs, he was Kukulkan. To the, the ones who lived around Palenque, he was Votan. And to the uh, Mayas, he was Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent. And this man came from the sea with a bonnet of wonderful plumes, almost like wings. And on his breast he carried a cross. He came to them, and they received him with regard and esteem. And he taught them all the things that Oannes had taught the Chaldeans. He helped them to establish a permanent way of life. He gave them the beginnings of a written language, the only written language in the Western Hemisphere. He gave them good government. And then he said, now I go away. But keep the rules that I have given you. And in due time, I will return. Now, these stories are interesting. There's nothing you can do but remember these strange stories. The same story exists in China. In China, the world's reformation, the restoration of humanity was the result of a mysterious being who came out of a fish's mouth and rising out of the sea taught them the secrets of life. In India, Vishnu, in his first incarnation, is born from the fish's mouth. Everywhere the, the sea was the source of instruction. Something came from the sea. We can't dogmatize what it is, but it is interesting that at a remote period, certainly eight or ten thousand years ago, if not more, Doctrines and concepts and beliefs reached all parts of the world and are still reserved and preserved in all the mythologies, legends, and allegories of ancient peoples and were, and were, <coughs> were recognized as the ultimate source of civilization. All right, guys, so you hear, hear it out of Manly P. Hall's mouth, and, and what he's saying there, regardless of what you think about Manly P. Hall, what he's saying there is absolutely true. All of these different civilizations tell this exact same story. And here we're gonna I'm gonna focus in on a couple of these stories, a couple of these legends, a couple of these reasons that a lot of civilizations even have their worship or exist. Uh, first, we're gonna talk about the Jew, German Ubermensch. Now, Ubermensch Mensch is a word for man, and Uber means like the best, the better, the better man. And what they were trying to do in Germany, without talking too much about it, they were trying to look for this better man because they believed the stories of this serpent king type person, this blonde-headed, blue-eyed man that comes to their civilization and that lived longer, that was taller, bigger, stronger, and had better technology. They believed this story, and they wanted to find them, and they did everything in their power. A lot of people believe that they rested in at Antarctica, and this is the reason that bases were set up like New Schwabie Land. Uh, this is the reason for Admiral Byrd's excavation or his journey to uh, the South Pole, and or at least what he was trying to get to the South Pole, and the reason that a lot of people died in these excavation in these uh, expeditions. And David, I know we've talked a lot about Admiral Byrd and his diaries and what he encountered there, and the story is all too similar, if not exactly the same, as these stories of these people we're talking about here. The similarity is unmistakable. And there are many that would just dismiss Admiral Byrd as uh, someone that became delusional. Everything about the man would mitigate against that, that he was anything but a crackpot, disillusional guy. And everything that Mr. Byrd claims he saw 
there uh, and Antarctica, it just lines up so much with everything we've studied with what's in Scripture and all of these ancient records. Therefore, I have to give uh, Mr. Bird a big check mark for credibility. Agreed. And one of the most interesting stories of this that I think line up with Bird's story, it lines up with the Atlantis story, and it probably has more recorded stuff about these people than any of the rest is the Tuath de Danan, and we're going to talk about them um, here. And so I've got some excerpts from an encyclopedia called, uh, it's by John T. Cox, uh, Celtic Culture, a historical encyclopedia, and I pulled some articles from uh, pages 1693 to 1697 about this. And so I'm just going to read this to you guys. It says, the Tuath de are often depicted as kings, queens, druids, bards, warriors, heroes, healers, and craftsmen who have supernatural powers. They dwell in the other world, but interact with humans and the human world. They are associated with the seed, prominent ancient burial mounds such as the Bruna and Bonet, and they are entrances to other world realms. It has also been suggested that the Danan is a conflation of Dan, making Dan, I'm sorry, and the goddess name Anan. The name is also found in Danan, Domnen, which point to the original being Celtic, Don, meaning earth. Interesting here, huh? Especially in reference to Robert Sipper's video about Donald Trump and also the video that we had done about Donald Trump about the Antichrist. It's really interesting because that word means earth or domain. And yeah. you have these little earth earth mounds that you see all over Ireland where they suppose fairies were coming out of, and we're going to start to understand why here in a second. So medieval texts about the Tuath Day were written by Christians, and sometimes they explain the Tuath Day as fallen angels who were neither holy good nor holy evil, and some of them were just basically they were uh, in they didn't really care. Um, they were trying to not have the world destroyed, so they would share information. And which is kind of like what Admiral Byrne de Bird describes, and we'll talk about why here in a little while. And um, they were highly skilled in magic, but several writers acknowledged that at least some of them had been gods. The Tuath Day eventually became the Ice Seed, the Seed Folks, or Fairies of later folklore. However, Irish monks also began using the term Tuath Day to refer to the Israelites with the people, with meaning people of God. They live in the other world, which is described as either a parallel world or a heavenly land beyond the sea or under the earth's surface. Many of them are associated with specific places in the landscape, especially the seed mountains, the ancient burial mounds, and passage tombs, which are entrances to the other world realms. The Tuath Day can hide themselves with entrances to other world realms. The Tuath Day can hide themselves with the Feath Fede, they are the magic mist, and appears to humans only when they wish to. In some tales, such as Bel in Scale, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, a king receives affirmation of his legitimacy from one of the Tuath Day. In other tales, a king's right to rule is affirmed by an encounter with the otherworldly woman. It has been argued that the inauguration of Irish kings originally represents his ritual marriage to the goddess of the land. The Tuath Day can also bring doom to unrightful kings. Um, and speaking to all of this, speaking to the last part there about the um, the ritual marriage to the goddess, uh, reading a book about um, Cyrus, there was a book about Cyrus, and part of his um, transition to king, he had to be accepted by the goddess in, in a way that was almost sexual in a way, he had to be accepted by this goddess in order to maintain king. So you even see it in the Persians, you even see it in Assyrians as well. And David, you can probably speak to this quite a bit as well. Well, in these visuals we see here, uh, just in the name Tuath De Danan, we see a verbal uh, assimilation with the tribe of Dan. And also, and, and that one lady is styling there. She can ride her horse with a little snake on her head. She's styling. And there in the bottom left, the this one uh, goddess-like figure is holding the cup. And the Tuath De Danan and the tribe of Dan, these legends overlap with the legend of the Grail. And they overlap with the European bloodlines who believe that they were from the tribe of Dan and from this, uh, the line of the Despacini, supposedly through Mary Magdalene and Christ. So these overlap here and we're seeing together a coming, a coming together and an expression of this ancient story 
right here that you can see depicted visually so clearly. Yes, and um, so to kind of further on this story, this is a video by the Brehan Academy, and this is a, just a short video about Irish mythology, and it adds a little bit to this. Now listen closely because there's some really interesting elements that will be tied in later on in this show because, look, we're, we're not even getting started here. Let's, let's just put it that way. And we're going to talk about the scriptures that tie this all in. So this is not just mythology. The scriptures literally mention this stuff in a way that unless you actually knew about it, it'd be hard to see. So let's check this out. The principal figures of the two Adidanim established their otherworldly palaces, or brew, within prominent mounds, many of which still exist to this day. Some of the key characters make appearances as gods and goddesses in both the Ulster and Fenian cycles, sometimes taking the form of a divine parent or appearing to lend guidance or support to a warrior in need. But it's important to note that they are not worshipped as gods and goddesses in a religious sense in the other cycles. In some cases, human remains have even been found inside the passages of these mounds, leading archaeologists to interpret them as burial mounds, passage tombs, or tumuli. Sometimes they are called fairy forts, and they were known as she in the native tongue. The people who lived there were the ace she, or dina she, that is, the people of the she, or the people of the hills. And while we see here that the people sometimes called them Undini Maha, or the good people, this was done so out of fear of the fairies, in case the fairies might be listening, and not because they were thought to be actually benevolent. In some accounts, it is portrayed that the Tua Hedadanan, the fairies, hate the men of Ireland for having driven them out of their worldly kingdom into the hills, which draws a parallel with the fallen angels of the Bible and the jinn of Islam. Mounds and tulloks were believed to be fairy forts and are still called so to this day. These were the otherworldly and magical domains of the fairies. Strange things are said to happen around them. Animals would not approach them, for example, and people dare not enter near them, and farmers dare not level them because of the fear of the wrath of the she dwelling inside. Perhaps the most well-known of the she is that infamous Gaelic omen, the Banshee, which literally means the woman she, or woman person of the hills, a woman fairy. Her wailing scream is said to be a portent of death to those who hear it, but traditionally she visits only certain Gaelic families. Following the logic of the word Banshee, expert in Celticology and mythology, Peter Beresford Ellis has speculated that the word fairy may derive from Far She, which would mean a man she, or a man person of the hills, or a man fairy, a fair she, or a fairy, fairy. Incidentally, he considers that the word pixie could similarly derive from a reference to the Picts, a mysterious pre scotic race inhabited in North Britain who could be Pictsies or Pixies. Regardless of what we think of all this, the fairies, which are the minimised descendants of the Tua Hadadanan, were thought to be real, and this had a significant influence on the beliefs and therefore the actions of the people who held to the superstitions. So we, we even have stories of people that were killed because of these superstitions. There were actually people used to think that they would take their babies and replace them with a baby of their own. And that we even had families who would kill their own babies because they would say they would swear that this is not their baby. Somebody took their baby and replaced it yeah. with another kind of baby. Yeah. And this, this is interesting. Uh, the, also, the idea of these mounds, like you guys did a show on Saturday on about Atlantis on FOJC, where yep. you guys talked about these mounds and how you can see them. I mean, right down the road, where you live on the Ohio Valley, oh, yeah. right here. Yeah. Yeah, that broadcast, Atlantis in America, we unpacked that very thing. And not that long ago, in Iceland, there was a construction project going on. And the workers went on strike and they refused to work the because principal... they said that they were disrupting these little fairy houses. Yeah. They were seeing the little people and disrupting the fairy. I mean, these guys quit. They said, yeah. uh-uh, no, yeah. we ain't doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, there's real, real legends and real things that are going on with these places. People who are skeptics that go there and, and end up never going back. Um, now, another thing that was interestingly talked about were the Picts. Now, the Picts were always, they called the tattooed people. They were depicted all, a lot of times wearing blue or being painted in blue. And these were um, a offspring of these Tuath de Danan. 
And so they were kind of like, you know, our modern day Nephilim, right? They were like a, a diminished version of that bloodline. Uh, interestingly enough, these people, these blue bloods, um, most of the kings that are in England as of now come from Scottish royalty bloodline, which is where these royal picks come from. Now, let's, let's go this way. So a lot of people say, well, I'm from Scotland or I'm this or that. You have to understand that a lot of these tribes, these people were tribes of priests or tribes of royalty in general. And when these people made it together, they made it only together. So you won't see too much bleed over into the average population because they hold that blood very, very sacred. Am I right? David, you expand on that a little bit. Well, that is absolutely right. And just like among the Gauls, and the Gauls were the people Paul wrote the epistle to the Galatians to, the Gallic people who, when they migrated to Britain, they become the Celtic people. And there was a ruling tribe. Of, they, they were like a ruling class of people that were a foot to two foot higher than the average person that ruled over the mass of the people. So not all of them, just like John says, we're not talking about uh, a completely uh, corrupted uh, populace there. We're talking about basically a Nephilim ruling priest class that's ruling over the mass of the people. Yes, and and virtually all of, and in, in you see this, the Hindu god over here to the right with the bull, um, almost all Hindu gods, actually all Hindu gods of any value are depicted as blue. And the reason for that is because, believe it or not, and you can look this up if you don't believe me, but the Hindu texts are actually Aryan compiled scriptures. So they are Aryan in nature. And um, that's where they come from. This is why it's so valuable, why you see the same symbols in Hinduism that you would see in Germany or other lands as such, um, because of this is exactly the reason. And so continuing on, we're going to get into some biblical references here, because I would love to talk about the uh, Og, because when I was researching this um, about Dan, the word Bashan kept coming up. And of course, when you hear Bashan, you have to think of King Og. And so we're going to dig really deep into this and see where this connection is. This is really interesting to me because I've never seen this connection before. Other people may have seen it. Uh, I've never seen anybody uh, make this connection, but it's very possible that the, it has been done before. I'm not, I, I can't remember everything. So Deuteronomy 3, 11 and 13, as it says, for only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron, is it not in Rabath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man. And the rest of Gilead and all Bashan, being the kingdom of Og, gave it unto the half-tribe of Manasseh, all the region of Argon, with all Bashan, which is called the land of giants. So we know that Bashan is called the land of giants. This is very interesting. I've got a few words highlighted here. We'll talk about those as we go. I want to talk about Bashan. So in the in the Hebrew uh, concordance, in the Strong's, we, is a proper name location. They don't really try to transliterate. They don't really try to translate it because it's not really a Hebrew word, but it is come from the Proto-Semitic word, which is um, Ugardic in nature, Ugardic text, which means serpent and dragon in the Ugardic text. And this is pulling from text where the Phoenicians would have been reading, like the, in Biblios and areas surrounding that area where these words are used often. Og was mentioned in the Ugaritic text, as well as Rephaim were mentioned in the Ugaritic text. This was a common term at the time. This land was designated as the king of the dragons, the king of Bashan, and the, in Rephaim itself is a very interesting word, which I don't have pulled up here, but it, it seems to denote a healing or almost a coming back, and it, it means shades, it means ghosts, this word Raphaim, which is little different from Nephilim. Now, Og is interesting because he is mentioned pre-flood as well as post-flood. Um, and so Og is a huge player in this, the last of the kings. And this to me is very interesting. And I'm sure some people have heard this before, but I'm going to continue. Joshua 12, and I'm, it says, And the coast of Og, king of Bashan, which was of the remnant of the giants that dwelt at Ashtaroth and at Adre, and reigned in Mount Hermon, that's interesting too, and in Salka, and in all Bashan, unto the border of the Geshurites and the Makathites, and half Gilead, the border of Sihon, king of Heshbon. 
And for those of you guys that have been listening to Now You See TV or FOJC long enough, you have heard about Mount Hermon. Now, Mount Hermon is the place in the Book of Enoch where the fallen watchers came down in the pre-flood. 200 watchers came down to Mount Hermon. It's mentioned in Genesis 6 where the sons of God went unto the daughters of men and took wives of them and had children with them. And they became giants, mighty men, men of renown, similar to what we're talking about here with boys like Og, big boys like Og. Now his bed was nine cubits, which some people would say is anywhere from 13 to 15 feet. This was a big man. And uh, the Israelites, Joshua and them, went in and took took uh, action on these guys, right? And they, they took them out. So continuing here, uh, Og's literal interpretation from the Hebrew is long neck, and that's Strong's number H54, um, or 5747. And there's a movie that came out not too long ago called, called Avatar. And what is interesting about this movie, Avatar, is that these beans, these blue beans, blue, blue, they're blue if you didn't see that, they have long necks, very long necks. Um, and I watched this movie, and the whole point of this movie is there's this world where these otherworldly explorers would love to come into, but they have to look like the natives. And so they create these avatar bodies that they can inject themselves into and live amongst these native people. This is the craziest part about it is their God is, uh, I believe, like Awa or Yahweh or something like that. Yahoo, one of these names that's kind of like Yahweh, right? But they create these avatars and they live in these avatars so that they can infiltrate this society. It's really crazy to me and really interesting and there's other stories i heard you talk about david about long neck tribes etc in the area yeah yeah the the anakim and also you check me midnight ride audience but i do believe and i'm not going to call the name because i don't want to misspeak but i believe that the guy that produced this avatar movie he spent a lot 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 of money trying to prove that they found the body of jesus yeah. and that he didn't raise from the dead there's a spirit behind this yeah. there's the spirit of antichrist the big strong demonic spirit behind this whole thing agreed man big time and this verse that we just read earlier i've highlighted bedstead of iron this is an interesting thing because mm -hmm. for me for for some reason when i read this I instantly my mind automatically went to deuteronomy 42 four and three or Deuteronomy two forty three, and it says and whereas thou saw iron mixed with miry clay they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men but they shall not cleave one to another even as iron is not mixed with clay now the kingdom of this world that we currently exist is this iron this last kingdom that Daniel has described where we have the iron mixed with clay and if it's possible that King Og has something to do with this this could be somewhat why this iron's in here now there might be more to this iron bed than meets the eye and we're going to explore that here in a little bit now interestingly this is something that a uh, handmaid's tale this interest me interested me uh to no end when i saw it because of the name the republic of gilead is where this breeding center of this republic that is in america mind you is breeding these children because they have a problem with them being able to breed so they bring these handmaids in and they impregnate them these elites do and they have children with them. This is really interesting. Now, Bashan was actually called Gilead. In many, many scriptures, it was called Gilead. And this is exactly where they had this. Now, it got my wheels turning here, as you can see, because I know that these movies and these shows are predictions and they are historical things. They are ways of telling the mysteries to those who are initiated in a way that they can see them on the screen. Uh, even Disney. Disney makes sure to tell the stories of the fairies and the kings and all of these different things through their literature. So one day, when this man comes back, whoever this man comes back that is going to all these civilizations, he can be accepted with open arms. That's my opinion anyway. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about this area. There's this called the Wheel of Giants in the Golan Heights. And the, in the scripture, it talks about it. It talks about this area and about how his place can be found. Now, I believe if anybody were to excavate this site, they may in fact find the body or the bed of Og. And I really believe that. So we're going to check this out a little bit about it, and then we're going to talk about it. So here we go. 
circles of stone with a huge dolmen in its center. And the largest block here is 37 tons, but there's thousands of tons in total when you actually look around. And so this was a very capable people who did this. And it, you know, some people have claimed, if you look at it, you know, the, the design and shape of it, it's got this classic reconstruction of what Atlantis looks like with the concentric circles, with the kind of central area right in the middle of it. So there's a lot, there's a lot to consider when you come to these sites. And I think it could be even older, it could be thousands of years old, but I wanna get inside and go underneath and have a look because this is where it gets really, really interesting. So we're already in the first outer wall. Now we're gonna head in, you can see the construction here actually. So it's kind of like cyclopean construction all the way around the site. It's not beautifully cut polygonal walls or anything, but I wanna kind of get in and see the dolmen really. Beautiful mountains in the background there. It's a big, big old area. So now we're heading down into the main dolmen structure here at Gilgal Rephaim and you have to go right inside, JJ's been in already, crawl in and kind of do all that uh, to see this giant capstone which is just underneath all these rocks here. So this is the central most sacred part of this very very ancient site. So we're inside the chamber here at uh, Gilgal Raphaim. It's a very small chamber, it's very dark. It's very cold as well. Strangely cold in here now. That could have been its purpose to give this kind of sense of the chills. It could be haunted, it could have the gin here. These were really chambers for the gin, in my opinion, as well as being burial chambers and used for other you know, things like ceremonies, initiations and so forth. So it's really hard to see it. So he goes on to look at that if you want to check it out. It's Megalithic Mania doc, uh, right, on YouTube. And he talks about these things and it really interesting stuff. And this is, you kind of get the gist of what he's talking about here. But this is one of these sites here. And the reason I brought this up is because not only do I believe that this could be possibly at least a giant grave, if not Gog or Og's giant grave, um, right here in this area. And so... Anything. Moving on here, um, this is interesting too because the center of Baal worship or started around Mount Hermon, started in this area. Um, the first Baal, uh, the god, the highest god of the Phoenician order is called Baal Haman. Uh, David, we did a show one time about tracing Baal all through the different mountains around that area. And this is why, because this is yeah. the, I believe that Og is the original Baal. And I'll show you why here in a second. This is a terracotta statue. He's got sphinxes and he wears a crown. Uh, I'm going to read this. This is from the encyclopedia. It says, in Carthage in North Africa, Baal Haman was especially associated with the ram and was worshipped also as Baal Karnim, Lord of the Two Horns. In the open-air sanctuary of Jabal Bukornin, the two-horned hill across the bay from Carthage and Tunisia, according to the Greeks and the Romans, he promoted child sacrifice, likely in times of strife or crisis, or only by leaps, elites, perhaps for the good of the whole community, this practice was recorded by Greeks and Romans. And David, if you'd like to speak to this a little bit, um, please go ahead, because I know you trace, when we did that show on our Book of Enoch video commentary, you traced the mountains of Baal, and they're scattered all through this area that Og controlled, which is very interesting. Yeah, and I actually uh, did a teaching one time. There's like... Uh, Baal Karnahim, Baal of the two horns. We see in Genesis 14, Ashtoreth Karnahim, the goddess of the two horns. And the the Baal, the city was named after the specific manifestation of Baal that was there. And this gives us a consistent picture of pre-flood and post-flood worship of this male-female uh, counterpart entities. 
And the we know from, we've talked about in the 15th chapter of the book of Enoch, that when these Nephilim die, that they become the devils that we read of in the New Testament. And like you said, these guys up here, these are the bad boys. These are bad bammer jammers. And in Psalm, the 22nd Psalm, which prophesies the suffering of Christ on the cross in verse 12, it says, many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan beset me around. That, that handmade tale that's brought to you by the bulls of Bashan, the avatar is brought to you by the bulls of Bashan. And I just feel like apologizing on behalf of um, the farce that Christianity has become in these last days of apostasy. I have great respect for many people that are uncovering the truth that don't even name the name of Jesus. I have respect for those people. They are, you can get more truth out of many people that don't name the name of Christ than you can out of most pulpits on Sunday morning. I have no sure. respect for an apostate church that does not care about truth, that just cares about their next airplane or their next offering they're going to take up or what they can compromise on to make themselves more profitable. And to all of you out there that are researchers that are not believers, I apologize to you on behalf of this apostate church. I respect you more than them. Do not judge the word of God by these men. Do not judge Jesus Christ by these men. The truth is in Jesus Christ, and the truth is in the word of God. Amen. We exhort you to look to Jesus. That's, 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 so, that's so true, because look, these things have been right in our face for a long time, but been hidden by the church for some reason or another. And I think we know why. We'll figure out even more why by the time this is in. So let's let's take a closer look at Bashan. We've taken a little bit of a look. Now let's take a closer look. Um, here we go. In Deuteronomy 33, 22, interesting number, by the way. And it says, and of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's whelp. He shall leap from Bashan. Now, Bashan is an area where, where Dan was given uh, that area, close to that area. Uh, but also, when we look at the word Bashan, it could also be translated as Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's whelp. He shall leap from the serpent or from the dragon. Yeah. Um, can very well be translated in that way. Yeah. So in Genesis 49, 17, it says, Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse heels so that his rider shall fall backward interesting connection there you know when we study when me and david study our our goal is to go through scripture we look and we exhaust whatever word we're looking for we find every scripture that has to do with that word and it's so amazing how these puzzles come together when you can do that this is this yeah. is a great thing yeah. so here we go next puzzle piece judges five seventeen, gilead abode beyond jordan why did dan remain in ships <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to find out why, guys. And hit like if you want me to keep going. I can make this a part two or I can keep going. Let's, let's hit the like if you like it. Forget the pounder's pound right now. Hit the like if you want me to keep going. You so, know you like it. Oh, I know. You I like know it. you like I, it. We're enjoying it. We're enjoying it. I want to keep going, but it is, it is, uh, it, we can keep going. This will be a while. Okay, so here we go. All right, it says Gilead abode beyond Jordan. And why did Dan remain in ship? So let's, let's think about this for a second. Uh, Second Chronicles 2. 12 through 14. Huram said, Moreover, blessed be the Lord God of Israel that made heaven and earth, who have given to David the king a wise son, enduring with prudence and understanding that might build a house for the Lord and a house for his kingdom. And now I have sent a cunning man, endued with understanding, of Huram my father's, the son of a woman of the daughters of Dan, and his father was a man of Tyre, skillful to work in gold and in silver and in brass and iron and stone and in timber and purple and blue and in fine linen and in crimson, also to grave any manner of graving and to find out every device which shall be put to him with thy cunning men and with cunning men of the Lord David thy father. So Huram is a king of Tyre. He is the king of Tyre that was uh, responsible for bringing Solomon the cedars, he was responsible for bringing him the gold from Ophir. He was responsible for all of that. And we're this going to make this real clear in a few of these verses. In Second Chronicles 8.18, And Huram sent him by the hands of his servants' ships and servants that had knowledge of the sea, 
And they went with the servants of Solomon to Ophir, and they thence 450 talents of gold and brought them to King Solomon. Second Chronicles 9.21, For the king's ships went to Tarshish with the servants of Hurim. Every three years once came the ships of Tarshish, bringing gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. So all kinds of stuff that they don't have around that area, they were bringing to them, right? These were the guys, they come, they were like... Prince Ali rolling through with <laughs> elephants and stuff. All right, and, These... and, and where were they going that it took them three years to make a round trip? It's, Come on. Exactly. Yeah. And Second Chronicles 8, 2. That the cities which Huram had destroyed to Solomon, Solomon built them and caused the children of Israel to dwell there. So he actually restored these cities to Solomon. And so the children of Israel could live there. This gets really interesting. Okay. We're just getting started here. Now, we've talked about these maps of the Sea Kings, maps of the ancient Sea Kings before. These are a compilation of maps from the people that we are currently talking about. Now, they had control of an area, which I'll show you here in a second. They are the bringers of the idea of Hyperborea. They are the bringers of the wild beast that you see in the sea. And part of the reason that they did this stuff is because they didn't want anybody else venturing out. And we're going to see why, because there was big riches to be foreseen out in these areas. Now, this is Lebanon. This is where uh, Phoenician capital was. This is right in Bashan, Jordan area. This is where we're talking about here. This is it. I got it highlighted here on the map. Um, all the way out here towards Spain, on this end of Spain, they controlled all of this sea here and everything past it. They actually set up the Pillars of Hercules to get out when you had to get out of this area that goes underneath Rome and Greece and Italy, all these areas right here that they controlled, Libya, Egypt, Algeria. They had they would not let people out of this area, and they controlled the sea all far beyond, all the way to America even. This is why we find Templar symbolism, Aryan symbolism, all through America. It's really interesting. One quick little fact. Please, no, make it long, fact. The, Let's do it. <laughs> the place where Solomon built the house of the forest, and every three years they were bringing this stuff in, it was at Baalbek. Yeah. It was at Baalbek, yeah. the very place where he built the house of the forest. Yes, it was. It was, and he had his groves there. Solomon had groves yeah. there. It was really, really an interesting area. But this map really gives you kind of a, a gist of what they controlled here because literally all of these people that were being in the Middle East and, and, and even all of the people that were actually a part of um, Europe and Africa, they they didn't know the sea. They had no idea. That's why these people knew the sea. They were scared. They thought they were going to fall off the side of the earth. They thought there was big monsters that were going to come get them because this is what these people told them. And now Carthage mentions Carthage here. Carthage is mentioned by Plato and the Greeks as being the first civilized nation before the Greeks. They knew everything before the Greeks did. The Greeks learned most of their stuff from these people. And this is where we get the offspring of Apollo. Uh, there's stories of Apollo visiting the Oracle of Delphi coming from the north. It comes down. He's the children of one of these uh, beings. It's really interesting the way all of it plays in. And, of course, Apollo, you can tie in with Baal and all of that stuff. And, of course, in the scripture, Baal is the ultimate enemy of God throughout all of this. He seems like the people always want to go right back to Baal because originally their Phoenician counterparts, which have basically the same language, that's what they worship. So they're always wanting to go back to that. This is why we have the bull worship that they did in Exodus. They put up the bull thinking it was to God, thinking all this, but this is where this all this stuff come from. All right, so this is, this is here we go. This gets interesting. The one-eyed shepherd. Now, we talked about some of this stuff. There's a video that I watched um, about this video. Actually, the video I played earlier from the Irish gentleman that talks about this, and he talks about one of these Tuathenan that has got his one of his eyes taken out, his right eye taken out in a battle, and his arm cut off and made himself a silver arm to go into battle with against giants and everything else in the area. Okay, so furthering into Bashan, Lebanon, which we just highlighted here. This is why this is how it all comes out, because you look at Lebanon, you look at Sh uh, Bashan, these verses start popping up, okay? So Zechariah 11, uh, verses 1 through 3, it says, Open your doors, Lebanon, and fire will consume your cedars. Wail, cypress tree, for the cedars have fallen while the stately trees are destroyed. Wail, oak trees of Bashan, for the old growth forest has been cut down. Hear the welling of the shepherds, for the magnificent of the forest is ruined. Hear the roar of the lions, the young lions whelp, from the Jordan, arrogance is ruined. 
Now, this is the verse that continues to talk about the shepherd. There's like two, a parallel of these shepherds, and there's one shepherd that is the idle shepherd that leaves the flock, which he, remember, he says, I'll leave, and I'm coming again one day, leaves the flock, has his right hand withered, and his right eye consumed, gone. This is the shepherd that is talked about in Zechariah 11 and dealing with Bashan and dealing with Lebanon. David, did you have anything to add before I continue here? Well, it is just so obvious. Uh, Genesis 49, 9 calls Judah a lion's whelp. Deuteronomy 33, 22 calls Dan a lion's whelp. We've got the true Messiah. We've got the false Messiah. We've got the true shepherd, the false shepherd. It is just so in your face and so tight that you'll miss it to your own destruction. That's right. And Jeremiah 8. 16 through 22, the snoring of his horses were heard from Dan. The whole land trembled at the sound of the neighing of his strong ones, for they are come and have devoured the land and all that is in it, the city and those that dwell therein. For behold, I will send serpents, cockatrices among you, which will not be charmed, and they shall bite you, saith the Lord. Now stopping there for a minute, we've done shows that talk about how Israel was involved in mixing genetics, creating these cockatrices by weaving, weaving spiders and weaving... Uh, spider webs and also the eggs of serpents, right? And these cockatrices come forth, which is interesting that it mentions here. And that's also mentioned with, uh, in reference to Israel. It says, when I, come, when I would comfort myself against sorrow, my heart is faint in me. Behold, the voice of the cry of the daughter of my people because of them that dwell in a far country. Is not the Lord in Zion? Is not her king in her? In her? Why have they provoked me to anger in their graven images and with strange vanities? The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the hurt of the daughter of my people am I hurt. I am black. Astonishment hath taken hold on me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of thy daughter of my people recovered? So just another reference here to Bashan that, in my opinion, ties in some pretty interesting t stuff. David, did you have anything? Well, I've, I, I have here the... Antonicene Fathers Irenaeus, and I actually have the book. This doesn't come from the website of Joff, the humming priest, <laughs> but it actually says here, this is on page 559, this is on volume one of the Antonicene Fathers, it says, and Jeremiah does not merely point out his sudden coming, but he even indicates the tribe from which he shall come, where he says, we shall hear the voice of the swift horses from Dan. Here he begins quoting Jeremiah chapter 8, which very, which in the second and third centuries, even in the first, many of the Christian uh, believers believed absolutely that the beast was going to come from the tribe of Dan. Yeah, and I can see why. There's a lot, a lot of things pointing to that. So Jeremiah 8, 1 through 3, this will start making sense. This is really cryptic and, 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 and really scary in a way if you really think about it for the people it's talking about. Jeremiah 8, 1 through 3. At that time, saith the Lord, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah and the bones of his princes and the bones of the priests and the bones of the prophets and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves. And they shall spread them before the sun and the moon and all the hosts of heaven who they have loved and whom they have served and after whom they have walked and whom they have sought and whom they have worshipped. They shall not be gathered nor buried, for they shall be dung upon the face of the earth. And death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue of them that remain of this evil family, which remaineth in all places whither I have driven them, saith the Lord of hosts. Very cryptic, very interesting there. Amos 8.14 They that swear by the sin of Samaria and say thy God, O Dan, liveth, and the manner of Beersheba liveth, even they shall fall and never rise up again. This is interesting because there's a denotation of Zionism here. Because we have Beersheba, this is where the they call it the stone, the heap of stones. Some people call it the seven seven stones monument, the seven uh, monument. And this is where Abraham and Abimelech made a kind of a deal here. Abraham dug a well, and he split seven ewes in half, and they made this deal that Abraham built this well. And this so this is this is part of that this oath of Samaria. Now, David, you've talked before about them that swear by the sin of Samaria and I and I would love for you to bring out a little bit of that what's your what is your take on that because to me there's a lot that could be but there's interesting stuff there 
there's a, a text, and I, I can't call it. I can look it up, but it talks about uh, in the calf worship of Jeroboam, it says they shall worship the calf and the devils. That is literally transla- that is translating the, the word satire. And literally, when we saw those caves there around Gilgal, Rephaim, you're literally looking at ancient chambers where these things of darkness were performed with, uh, with, with the Nephilim. And you mentioned Zionism, and I have another one of the apostolic fathers here. This is Hippolytus. This is volume five and uh, on page 246. And he prophesies that the nation of Israel in the last days would be ruled by the tribe of Dan. I'll just give you just a snippet. It says for, this is on page 246. He says for Judah was his fourth son and Dan again was his seventh. And what then did he say of him? Let Dan be a serpent sitting by the way that biteth the horse's heel. And what serpent was there but the deceiver from the beginning who is named in Genesis? He who deceived Eve and bruised Adam in his heel. For it is certain that he is designed to spring from the tribe of Dan. Dan shall judge his people as one tribe in Israel. And he goes on to spell out for sure that he's not talking about Samson. He's talking about the end time beast and the tribe that will take over Israel. And the bulls of Bashan are driving the bus over there for anybody that's paying attention. Agreed. And I, and I really think David through all this study, and I've got some more here I want to talk about, but I think through all of this study that I've that I really believe that there was some kind of book or imp- secret information or something found in the area of Bashan by Dan that caused them to take up, go to ships, and control the world. And there, if you study out Elijah there at Gilgal Rephaim, this is the very place Elijah was caught up in the whirlwind. And kind of the sometimes I got to kind of preach it the way I feel it. And I believe they were there having their little Nephilim church doing their thing, trying to open a portal. And they looked over and there was old Elijah just taken up in a whirlwind right before their eyes. Yeah. That very spot is where it was. Yeah. And absolutely, we see a uh, and all of this is tied uh, in the the Freemasonry. The seven sacred sciences are tied to the muses. And all of this ties into the recovery of antediluvian knowledge, whether through the emerald tablets of Thoth or Hermes or the two pillars of Adam that's recorded in Josephus. And this is the recovery of the antediluvian one world order that was launched again, like Mr. Hall said, from missionaries right from this place. And I think you're so spot on. They were re-energizing that antediluvian new world order and they are they are now at the very place where they they're expecting to see the culmination of it yeah for sure and and so let me let me wrap this up with a little bow if i it, you know this is this is this is <laughs> this get, it gets more interesting as time goes on and we could go on about this forever but i want to read an excerpt uh from a book um that David actually bought for me is really good by Joseph Farrell called Babylon Banksters. And I think he nails the agenda in this. He doesn't talk about it throughout the whole book, but there's one paragraph in here where I'm like, this guy, he nailed it right here. I mean, he may not have known it, but he nailed it. Okay. So here, here it goes. He says, but there, and this is, um, okay. So, but there's another possibility one suggests by the scenario of a cosmic war outlined in the first chapter. This is, this, this is, I believe is truly the agenda. And it says, and that is, if the survivors of the once scientifically sophisticated civilization were ever to reach the pinnacle of scientific power and achievement that would have made an interplanetary war possible, if that is, they were ever to reconstruct the destructive technologies of their hegemony and extend themselves again into space, then they would have quite literally to draw on the full resources of the entire world and to create the wars and conflicts that drove technology's achievements forward at a faster normal pace of development. In this case, they would develop not only secret associations for this purpose, but money and a close association with the temples would be the easiest and least technologically sophisticated method to do it, and the political goal would be the same, ever larger empires eventually to encompass the entire world itself. 
Now, this is interesting, especially in light of what a ancestor of mine named Francis Bacon wrote in his book, The New Atlantis. And in The New Atlantis, just like the story that Plato gives of Atlantis, he leaves the last sentences unfinished for a reason. Now, The New Atlantis was said to be um, America by Francis Bacon. So what happened in Atlantis, according to Plato and according to others, they developed a center where it was like the golden age. People were free. People were free to discover. People were free to do everything. Very prosperous. All of these things happened. But then dark magic and dark works entered into the people, forcing the gods to destroy them. Now, this war that happened with the gods is mentioned in Genesis 6. This is the flood narrative where the giants were destroyed, where the, the sons of God, the Tuathanan, or whoever you want to call these people, were taken and trapped inside of the earth. Okay, there are other fallen angels on earth as well, but these particular ones were trapped in earth, which is why all the stories, they don't know where they're at right now. They're gone, right? Some people say they went north, and I'm sure that there are entities in the north, okay? But this is what happened. Now, this new Atlantis was to be like the old Atlantis, to gain the prowess of the old Atlantis, but without the evil. This was the idea behind it. We do not want the evil because we want to build this thing worldwide. So with the, when the time comes, when the purpose comes to, for a cosmic war, we will have every resource available to us throughout the world. And part of the way that they did that was going to civilization, to civilization, to civilization, and building little Babylons all over the world so that their money system would work there because if there's no civilization there's no money system and if you don't have people mining for gold you're not getting gold so they had people all over the world especially in south america in the lands of the serpent land of the first serpent just gathering gold gathering resources and creating civilizations so that at one point right now they could harmonize all of these countries together gather their resources and what people don't understand about money is it is a form of alchemy especially with the monetary printing system that we have now you can create something out of nothing there is literally nothing but confidence backing the monetary system that we have that they were able to gather just large amounts of funds from all over the world subject the entire world into what we're doing and with, with that being said i wanted david to speak to this don't tread on me symbol you spoke to that in the show you did the serpent tribe of dan which i do suggest you guys checking that out to get more pieces of this puzzle but um this is normally on a flag david tell us a little bit about that yeah that was one of the on one of the early flags in the revolutionary war and there is many similarities between the tribe of dan and america there are so many similarities and i could uh I could even read a little snippet here. Uh, this is from a book called Beyond Science Fiction, Jim Wilhelmson, and he talks about the similarities of Dan in the U.S., and I wouldn't um, uh, subscribe or promote every all of the ideas, but I think this might be worth hearing. Uh, said, I would like to consider some of the similarities between Dan and the United States. The United States is the hindmost of nation empires, Jeremiah fifty twelve. Dan was last in the procession. The United States first had a flag with a snake on it with the saying, don't tread on me. That was changed to the national symbol of the eagle. As already stated, Dan changed from the serpent to the eagle in the same pattern as the U.S. The American flag was red and white stripes with a standard of blue to signify a new constellation in the heavens with 13 stars. Dan's banner was red, <laughs> was colored red and white. Levitical priesthood was the tribe of Levi. They were never counted as one of the tribes. In this understanding, Dan being one of the last tribes would have been number 13. You counted Levites. The eagle on our national crest has in the left claw the defensive side, 13 arrows on its claw. Now, if we were added as one of the tribes of Israel after the dispersion, we would be the 13th. And the eagle's claw out of the, in the eagle's right claw signifying righteousness, the eagle holds an olive branch. Mm -hmm. The founding fathers meant this to mean peace, and peace it does, but the olive tree is the national symbol of Israel. We could go on and on and on and on. And this is Manly P. Hall wrote books on the secret destiny of America, where they specifically said that America was to be the springboard of the new world order. It is time for people to wake up. Yeah. It's time for people to realize that our government 
and our apostate religious system is being run by the bulls of Bashan. People are going to have to start discerning between the spirit of Antichrist and the spirit of God. This is essential to your survival. It's it's super interesting, man. And you know this, and to to paint all of these stories in the exact same light is you know probably wouldn't be a hundred percent accurate because I do believe there are good angels out there. We know that. We know Absolutely. that there are good angels going and ministering to the people. We know that there are seven angels of the seven churches. We know that there are principalities over areas. You know, like the King of Tyre, the Prince of Tyre, the Prince of Grecia, the. Uh, all of the the Prince of Persia, these entities that are over the people, the Prince Michael, who is over the people of God, right? They, we know that they're there. We know that there are probably angels that are just trying to live in this world without it getting destroyed. So they're trying to stop people from doing stupid stuff because they want to live longer. They, yeah. they don't want to go to war with God because yeah. they already know what's going to happen, right? There, That's there, right. There are those as well. So we have a variety of different ones. Um, but it's important to test the spirits if we ever encounter these entities because the ones that are of God will profess the king of salvation. He will, they will profess that. And so it's important for us to understand that, keep that. But it's very clear to me that America was created with the intention of bringing the world together again so that when the king comes back, they can go to war with him. This is why we see Space Force with the goat on it, with the Apollo, with all of these things, because the war is getting ready to take place, guys. They're gathering their troops. I believe we are at the precipice of this. If not close, if not, you know, maybe a few years out, I don't know, but it's very close. It seems like they've gathered world resources. We have wars and rumors of wars taking place all abroad. Um, but the interesting thing about all of this guys is why this is why so many, um, Israel type things you see in, in England. This is why you see all this. So people always think, well, this is, these are the Israelites. Probably, but the problem is the Israelites did some bad stuff. They did some things, especially the kings. They went together, they formed against God, and they worshiped false gods. Can, uh, Dan did similar things. I mean, they were the priests of the serpent. And so when we look at this stuff as a full picture, I hope you guys get a little bit of a picture. I, we could go on about this for a long time, but the the facts remain that this story is a common story. I think that a lot of people get lost in where our civilizations come from because they don't believe the Bible. But when you believe the Bible, when you look at what it says, it starts to make sense. And and as a person who studied multitudes of mythologies, so David can tell you this as well, multitudes of legends, uh, the only one to me that fully makes sense together as a full story, not just with now, not just with the past, but also with the future, is the Word of God. Yeah. Um, all the other ones, they don't have an ending, just like Francis Bacon and the new Atlantis doesn't have an ending, just like the story that Plato offered didn't have an ending because there's a mystery there. But yeah. the mysteries can be found in the Word of God, and I hope that, that you guys see that, and I hope that you guys pick it up, do some searching, do some looking for yourself, because I'm telling you right now it will be the best thing that you do for yourself, and we hope you do it. And David, that's all I have. Did you have anything you want to add to that or anything like that? Well, I just might say this, that I I think this is one of my favorite all-time midnight rides. I really Thank do. You. I love it. It brings together so many things in so many ways. And I I just might say this, uh, and I just real really feel the Spirit of God burning on my heart that the Israel of God has every reason to be encouraged. One-third of the angels fell, but two-thirds didn't. We are on the right side of this thing. But... Romans chapter 6, verse 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. As Pedro Martinez would say, who's your daddy? <laughs> who's your daddy? And it's time to get on the right side of this thing. It's yeah. time to get compromise and double-mindedness out of your mind because we're going to win this thing. The Lord God omnipotent reigneth Amen. and it's time right now to get on the right side of this thing and i just really um i just really love this midnight ride i just really did i hope it gets two million views <laughs> I hope so, so like it we'll, and we'll we'll pounders pound it yes do it and uh on the count of three we're going to do go. the pounders pound and you know you liked it so yep. you like it you share it it's time to get the message out. Pound that it's, like it's time to get the message out. One, One.
two, three, boom. boom. Yes, guys, thank you so much. We are so blessed to call you our family. There's there's nothing better than to be able to come with you, come before you guys and speak and to see all you guys in the chat and the comments. You guys bring us joy, and we're thankful that there are other people out there that are truly on the path and and serving the one true king. So thank you so much, David and Sal. And indeed, because of you all that listen and support the Midnight Ride, we know that we're not alone. Yep. And that's the only way we can do this thing. So until next Saturday night, 10 p.m. Central, high five and good night, everybody, from the Midnight Ride. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up.